So guys, welcome to the uh, Espresso Mastery session today. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to someone that I think is gonna be perfect for, for what's going on. Corey Burtonier is here. He's 21 year in the military, retired now, works at, in Utah for Keller Williams and um, so, Corey, thanks for being on. I appreciate you being on today and taking time out of your busy schedule and uh, being on. Appreciate you having me. Yeah. So, Corey, uh, I, I want to bring up a lot of different things today and talk about your military background and the things that you've done. And we're going to talk later on, we're talking about the new project, too, because that's even just as exciting. So tell me about your military background and and being in the security forces, what was that all about? And then we're going to talk about how that relates to real estate. We'll get there. Sure. So uh, I started out, you know, as a brand new E1 in the military and didn't really know what was going on and, uh, you know, progressed all the way till retirement. But uh, security forces is basically, we're, re we're kind of, I don't know, people kind of look at us as uh, the army of the Air Force, if you will. We're, our responsibility is to protect everything inside of the base and to a certain distance outside of the base. So we do a lot of, you know, a bunch of different things, combat related and, you know, law enforcement related. So it's right. kind of the whole gamut of things. Yeah. And, and this is live ammunition. We're not, it's, it's, uh, this is not play. This is, uh, you, you're, you're in harm's way when you're doing that, I'm sure on a regular basis. Yes. Yeah. 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 You're, you're getting it kind of on both sides. You're, you're protecting a base somewhere or whatever, and you're also doing law enforcement things, which we all know that's, that's you know, you, you get it on both sides kind of. So, so yeah. So what, what, did, what did you learn from that experience? First of all, I'm in a, you know, I'm in SEAL team, you know, you were, you've been down here. I've been in SEAL team community here for the longest time. I know a bunch of these guys and, and it's yeah. always fascinating the mindset that you have to have in what you're doing. So um, if, what did you learn from that experience? I mean, tell me what you've, kind of surmise from being in those experiences? It, uh, discipline is probably the most important thing. Uh, everything kind of comes back to that, right? You're going to revert to what you've practiced, uh, what you're trained on. You know, that's, that's when the stress hits a certain level, right. you go back to that. And uh, if you're not consistently doing that practice, you're not going to be able to do that when the stress rises. So this is why you have no problem making phone calls to for sale owners and expires because it's a lot safer than what you did before. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty simple. Yes. You know, so, so when, when you're making these calls and, and that person, I don't know, is irate. I mean, th does that training kick in? I mean, does that help you to kind of go, it's just uh, some guy going off on you. you? You don't, you don't take it personally, do you? No, no, it's, that's where that stuff starts to kick in, right? You kind of detach and you, you're basically your ability to stay calm in a situation is what kind of separates, you know, the, the trained and the, the ones that have kind of done it and the ones that haven't, I guess is an easy way to say it. Yeah. And you like systems. So tell us a little bit about, um, because you, you, you like structure and this is what you learn in the military. So in your business and how you approach your people Now, how long you've been in, in real estate so far? I want nine years at this point. Okay. I'm getting so, old. Yeah, man. Nine years in the, in, in this business and you're still here. And actually Corey had hair before he got in the, in the real estate business. Uh, so, so now tell us a little bit how you structure your business now. What is it? How did you start? I mean, what, did, what was the beginning of your business? How did you build it up? Sure. So I, I started out in Keller, obviously with Keller Williams and uh, I was, benefit i benefited from there was an office that needed some you know some some leadership i guess and uh i was able to step into what they call a team leader role a lot of people probably don't know what that means out there but essentially it's kind of like the ceo of the office uh you run you're responsible for everything in the office that happens you know from training to operations to you know everything else right and uh, so i got to do that for the first three years which was kind of like drinking from a fire hose of you know i was immediately i went from you know, I took my uniform off in the military on Friday and on Monday I came in in a suit and I was all of a sudden responsible for 
know, I went from being responsible for whatever, a bunch of my troops to, I had a bunch of contracting agents to take care of. Well, man, I wish I was there for that first day because I know that that must have been, so what was going through your head when you left the military right, right into this thing of, of taking care of us crazy people? Um, well, it was, it was interesting, the difference, that's for sure. People don't, uh, it was interesting as I guess the best way to say it without, I don't want to say anything mean. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, I mean, then from just having to change your style up, didn't you have to change the way you were running the show? I mean, you couldn't just go in like you did in the military. Was that hard for you? Yes, that was very different because, you know, in the military, you, you tell, especially I had worked myself into, you know, certain teams and things that when we said something or when we had a task, it was done. Like it, okay, you're taking care of that, great. It's going to be taken care of. Versus now it was, you know, check on it five times. And, you know, there's a lot of coddling and some things that went on. Not everybody, obviously. I mean, I don't want to paint a picture of that. But right. uh, anyways, it was just, yes, it was different. And I also had to be more understanding, I guess, is a way to say it, uh, because it wasn't as direct. My first six months, I kind of feel bad for some of those poor agents. Um, I can imagine so yeah. to me now, you know, they would come in and, and things would be going on and they would just, you know, I, I would ask very direct and blunt questions of, you know, have you done this or that? And they thought that that was the end of the world. So <laughs> anyways, it was, it was definitely a change. Yeah, it was. I remember you know, uh, when I first started managing years ago, I was like, I don't know, 32, 33. And the first issue I had to deal with, you'll love this. Uh, a lady was complaining about someone else in the office because her perfume was too strong and she had allergies. And I have two ladies sitting in front of me crying about this. And I'm going, what am I facing right now? So uh, I'm sure it, it, you know, for you, it must have been just, what am I doing here? So how long were you doing that before you got into doing it, um, sales on your own? So I did that for three years. Took, you know, learned a lot, took every class I could take. Uh, company was great about that. And uh, we were responsible for uh, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 transactions a year. So I, wow. like I said, I got a lot of experience in a very short period of time. Wrapped my arms around a lot of different things, which was great. Uh, and then I started, you know, after that three years, I went straight into, you know, during that time period, my wife Rhonda had been doing our production side. Um, as just our team and then her and I jumped into doing that together and we've kind of built it up to where we're at now. So um, you kind of did the reverse, you became a leader and then got back into sales. So how did you start to build that production up yourself? What did you do to start that whole thing rolling? Yeah. So where I'm at here, it's a little different because um, I didn't know anyone, right? I was military, I got dropped into the base and I had no family, I had no sphere of influence, I didn't have any of that stuff. So my thought was, let's be the best at open houses that we can be, you know? So we did, you know, seventh level open houses basically where we would do, I had open houses scheduled at least every week and um, I knocked all the hundred doors around them. I did all that stuff. So it was very much, here's the system that we're gonna do to build up our database and our sphere of influence at the same time. Interesting. So um, phone calls, you know, we called, did our, you know, our phone prospecting and all of that too. All right. So then um, that started working. And so um, what was the system? I mean, now because of COVID-19, things are a little bit different. I mean, some of the country is opening up. Um, so there's going to be maybe some of that happening with restrictions. And um, what's happening in your city for restrictions right now? What are you allowed to do? What, what can you not do? So they considered us essential here. So we got lucky as far, I don't know, lucky or you know, blessed on that part. Yep. And uh, so we can do what we need to do. Uh, no one's really doing open houses though. So that's, you know, that's different. Mm -hmm. There's a few here and there, but not too much is kind of frowned upon right now. Um, and that's starting to loosen up also, you know, here because we as, as Utah, we've only had, not only, I shouldn't say it that way, but we've got over 3 million people, almost 3.3, I think it is. Right. And we've had 
you know, minimal cases and we've had about 50 deaths or so. So, you know, percentage wise, as far as numbers are concerned, people are kind of starting to go back out again. You know, we went from red to orange and we're kind of following the, you know, the process as far as opening back up. So your, your market, uh, is it considered, uh, I don't know if, is it considered semi resort type of market also? We have that also. Yeah. Especially, you know, you go up into the valley up here where we're at. We have that. It's heavy up in that area and up in, you know, Park City, of course, and all of that. Uh, but down here on the Wasatch Front, we have, uh, you know, a normal market, I guess you would call it. Um, it's, uh, and we've got all aspects of real estate down in this area. So, um, yeah, it's, and it's been moving. You know, we had, we had a place where we kind of slowed down. Everybody kind of hunkered down for uh, about a week or two. You and I spoke during that time. It was kind of a weird dynamic yeah. here in that. Um, and then once everybody kind of started seeing, hey, the numbers aren't, you know, whatever people aren't, you know, there's not millions of people dying and all this kind of stuff. So it really started to shift fairly quickly for us here as far as, okay, we're going to keep, we still had buyers going out and we still had listings that were taken. Uh, but we also had the other side of it where some people were still scared. So we had to really figure out, you know, how do I do a listing presentation well over Zoom? So we had, we practiced that, you know, John is a guy that works with me. He, we practiced back and forth. We figured it all out. And we started being able to present a pretty decent, uh, you know, listing presentation over Zoom. Started taking listings out. So we, we just kind of, you know, flexibility is the key to everything as far as I'm concerned. So we just did what we had to do to be flexible and figure it out. So Rhonda's on, your wife's on the team. You have yep. John. So give us a breakdown how that's set up and how you're working that. Sure. So I do kind of the, the you know, in your face stuff. I go take the listings and I take out some of the buyers and stuff. Um, I kind of pre-screen everybody, if you will, uh, with my background that kind of comes in handy when it comes to that. You know, and I don't really want my wife going if possible by herself to a listing or whatever. Um, so anyways, I do that side and then she does all the operation side. So she's very, she does all the paperwork, all the transaction coordinating, and then she does all of our Facebook marketing and all that kind of stuff. And then John is a gentleman that we hired. He, he's kind of the jack of all trades, but his main job is, he will call uh, all day long. So he, he loves and is very good at the phone. So who's he calling? He's calling FISBOs and expireds, you know, and he's calling follow-ups and he's also of course calling new business. All right. So it's now, so being in the business for nine years, you made your mistakes, you fixed it, you know, you're, uh, and I think that you're the type of guy that uh, you don't let something go the wrong direction for too long. I mean, you kind of, tweak it and keep moving forward. So what are the things that you, over the last nine years, that, have you, that you've learned that's helpful for this new market that we're in? What, what have you figured out that, hey, I'm glad I did it or I've learned from this experience and now in this COVID-19 market, it's helped? Uh, in a single word, technology. Uh, there's a lot of people that were very afraid to get into any kind of technology. Uh, there's still some people, we have agents that are pretty old school and they don't want to do anything with technology, right. getting more and more and more difficult for them to function uh, in, in real estate in general, but especially when we have this type of situation where they don't even know what a Zoom call is, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it, it becomes very tough on them. And, um, and so you guys have been doing that now. Um, and John is making these FISBOs and expired calls things have opened up a little bit more for him, but in, in that time when no one knew what was going on, how did he handle the calls? I mean, how, well, are you tracking the numbers? I mean, how do you keep this thing moving? So, you know, this, this, uh, these expired and physical callers are working for you. Yeah. So we track all of his numbers. You know, we track, you know, how many calls he makes, how many contacts he has, how long does it take him to do it? You know, we, we, could, we track everything as much as possible. And we've got all of his numbers on the board and they sit there like a scoreboard for him for the past, like he's got, six or seven weeks on the board and we go over them all the time so he can see where he's at and you know whether he's winning or not and for about that two week period it was very difficult because we didn't want to come off you know at first we were kind of like all right are we going to come off as uncaring or you know you know stoic right, yeah. and, uh, we didn't want that to be the case obviously so we came across more as a hey do you need anything how are you doing how's this going you know by the way you know 
if you need to sell or if you need to do anything, we're here for you. But we quickly came out of that because like I said, here we saw the numbers were not as dramatic as what they originally were planned to be. So we went right back to normal hauling, if you will, back to the, the script. So, and they've been working. So we, we can't complain on this end. Yeah, and did you see a lot of difference in the uh, objections that people had? I mean, what we're seeing is some of them were pretty, the, the same old objections, nothing was unusual. Did you see everything, that? Everything was the same. The only unusual one was, hey, I'm afraid to do anything right now. You know, that was, but that only lasted, like I said, for a week or 10 days. And then everybody kind of came, you know, reality started to set in, I guess. And uh, so, no, no, it was basically keep on calling because everything is pretty much the same. Now, a lot of things you do, I think, I know you believe, I mean, you just do you, which you is different than what most real estate people are. I mean, you came in, you came in backwards. Now you're as an agent, but there's things that you do naturally that I think a lot of people don't do. And I think that is that you're tracking your numbers and um, that you're practicing a lot. So, you know, uh, that's something that people tend to put aside. I mean, your military background, you're constantly training, right? You're, you're training, you're, you're, you're perfecting what you do. What do you guys do now to perfect what you're doing? How, how do you keep this, that edge that you need for the market? Sure. So John, as an example, uh, he, he has different script partners that he's on with and we change those up uh, almost monthly, sometimes every so two months if they're doing really well, uh, because people, people will get in a groove on that kind of thing too. You know, it's the same person. They're like, Hey, I got a script partner, but I don't feel like I'm getting better. How long have you had that script partner? Oh, we've been doing this for like, you know, eight months. That's probably the problem, you know, right. get some new blood in there and get it going. Uh, so we do that a lot of script back and forth, him and I, uh, you know, we do questioning, you know, going five deep at least, uh, not being afraid to ask that next question and then phrasing of questions. We practice that, uh, we have a standing Monday, uh, but we go through that, uh, on a daily basis. So anyways, it's constant practice as far as that's concerned. And then for me, it's, I'm not above practicing anything. I practice my scripts with John. I practice my listing agreement or my listing presentation uh, that can always be better. So constantly going through that stuff. So, okay. So walk us through the process. So John's making the call to a FISBO and expired. So then you have your procedure or your steps of where you're taking the person. So John does what, and then what, what, what's the next step? He makes the contact, the contact be becomes a something, a lead or a follow-up, and then you're going to get to the listing presentation. Can you kind of walk us through the path there? Sure. So, you know, it makes a call, makes a contact, and then that contact is either an immediate scheduled appointment or it's put in as a follow-up and they are, and then we're followed up on. So, Follow-ups then keep contacting them until they become an appointment uh, or they, you know, whatever, disappear for some reason. Right. So once we go to an appointment, though, that's my job. So I go out and I either have the appointment in person or I have the appointment on Zoom, which has been happening recently. Right. Um, from that appointment, once they're signed, um, that, that individual then is kind of handed over to Rhonda and Rhonda will make a call that's an introductory call. And she talks to them, explains everything to them, goes over the paperwork with them and all of that stuff and, uh, and, and handles the, you know, scheduling of photography, uh, you know, all that stuff, all, all the rest of the paperwork side, the operation side. So, um, so he's, he, he's basically teeing you up. John doesn't go out on any presentations. He's making the calls. He sets you up on the presentation. Um, and how do you know that's a good appointment? What does he do to, pre-qualify that does he pre-qualify them or are you pre-qualifying the appointment no he pre-qualifies and we have a we have a pre-qualification and that's part of the making the appointment he goes through and we've got a bunch of questions that he asks to get as much information as we can he digs a little to try to find a little bit of a pain point if he can you know during that pre-qual mm -hmm. and um and yeah so then i have some information to go on plus i you know we do our market survey of course um and then we take i've i've got the information i need to do an accurate appointment or a, yeah. a qualified appointment. Uh, Christopher asked the question, he says, how do you track? Are you using Google, Google numbers? Uh, I don't know what that means, but uh, how, do you, how are you tracking? Uh, I guess, Chris, what you're saying is, are you tracking what John's calls or Google Voice he's saying? Okay, um, so how do you track what you're doing? We have a sheet that John makes little tick marks on 
Okay. Uh, we keep track of that stuff on a spreadsheet. Yeah. All right, good. And, and is he recording himself also to listen sometimes, to? Him? Sometimes he does. Yeah. So if that's, he will for practice purposes or for me to listen to and kind of QC him and help him out. So then, okay, so now here, here's this marketplace that we're in. And then John makes the call. You come in. What are you doing to separate yourself from someone else that's going after the same listing? I mean, obviously, there's got to be a differentiator that uh, this person goes, you know what, I, I like Corey and what he has versus. So tell us what you do that makes you look different than the other person or make that person feel that you're different. One thing is dress, you know, I go every, every appointment that I go to, I'm wearing, you know, a suit and tie. Uh, so my professional ap approach to everything, that's a big thing. And I've actually had people tell me flat out that I'm way more professional than other agents that they've interviewed or other people that were, you know, possibles. Uh, many times that's the case. And that's, that's a big differentiator, right? We dress and appearance is extremely important yep. when it comes to that. Uh, then when I actually get there, um, I have my, I have planned out, I already know my presentation and I can take control of the situation and, and walk them through it versus them having control and walking, you know, work, taking me places I don't want to go. Right. Right. And that's, that's a bad thing. Yeah. So that's a real big differentiator for me, especially when I see when I'm coaching and stuff, a lot of agents just kind of go and they stay in the, you know, hey, how are you doing? What are you doing? How's today? What's the weather? You know, all that stuff lasts for a long time. And you can almost tell that the client is like, hey, are we, what are we doing here? Like, this is my time. Yeah. Um, I don't like that and I won't ever do that. I'm very direct and I'll go in and I've got, I know I'm doing this, take them through it. And, and, we, and that has kept, and it, it works at all levels, right? We just took a listing the other day, it was 3.7 million. It doesn't matter whether or not it's a $200,000 home or a multi-million dollar home. It's the same thing. They all want you to be in charge because they're trusting you with such an important deal. Yeah, I think more now what you're saying is, uh, and I really believe that we have gotten way too casual in real estate. And, you know, listen, I know you and you, it's not that you want to be in a suit all day long. I mean, you're doing this because this is part of your job. It's like your uniform, right, from the military. Right. It's your uniform. So yeah, dress is another way that we can show high influence, high authority right off the bat. And that's been proven in the book, Influence, Science and Practice by Robert Gialdini. Clearly that the immediately you have high influence when you're dressed for the part and you should always be. So that's cool. And then you said uh, definitely not over reporting. No. Because you, and there's, first of all, there's no way that Corey will over report. <laughs> <laughs> anybody uh I mean, you don't have time for it. i mean you're running a business this is what we're talking about this is a business and now more than ever don't you think people want that leader that person to take them through this process yeah that's what i've noticed yes they want that and my and i'm personally my dollar per hour is too important to me like i owe it to my family and to john and to my you know my wife we i've got to make sure my dollar per hour is accurate it's not for talking about you know football for 30 minutes at an appointment. That's not what it's for. So yeah, it's be direct and walk them through it, take control of the situation. So, um, you know, we did a study years ago about the cost of going to a listing, actually going to a listing that was a complete waste of time and or you didn't pre-qualify well. And we came up with a number that was like $1,500. You know, you, 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 you get prepared, or John makes a call. You got to do what you got to do behind the scenes. You drive out there. You spend time there. You drive back. You don't get the listing. Easy fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred dollars worth of expense. If we started totaling up all of the appointments that we didn't get, and then use that as a number that we got to catch up to with with income, I mean, it it'd be sh it'd shock a lot of people. I think you know that yeah. that that expense. So. Now that the, the market seems to be, and your market has opened up, some of them are not exactly there yet. Right. Um, are you doing anything special right now, different? I mean, what, it, what have you tweaked anything because of the market, the COVID-19 market, um, to the point that it, it's, a, it's because you want to run the rest of the year a certain way? Anything that you've done specifically? The, be, getting, getting the Zoom listing appointment, figured out was something that now we can use as an option for people. So for example, 
somebody says, Hey, I can't meet in person until, you know, whatever, five days from now. Oh, okay. Well, do you have time tomorrow that you could, you know, you can squeeze me in for a zoom call. And sometimes that helps, right? So you've got another tool that we can use that was accidental kind of, right? Cause I would not have intended to do that on purpose, but yeah, that is something that we are keeping and we're going to continue to do that as long as possible, uh, especially with our clients right. that are out of town, you know, or whatever. I don't have to wait. You know, how many times have you scheduled an appointment five or six or seven days out? And by the time you get there, they've already signed with somebody because they happen to meet someone at the grocery store or whatever the case is that we can eliminate with the zoom, the online listing appointment it doesn't have to be zoom, but online. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's just say, um, they say to you, well, Gus, you know, how, how do you know what my house is worth if uh, you're not going to physically be there? How do you handle that situation? Sure. So we say, well, we'll give you a range right now and uh, we'll talk through all of that. You know, and that's actually part of my whole presentation is it, it leads up to where that question doesn't really happen. But I would tell them simply, we will talk about that in person once we come out and look at your home, for now we're talking about, do we wanna be in business relationship together or not? And if we do wanna be in business relationship together, great. So we'll talk through that side of things and then we'll get a final price when we come out to the home. So uh, I just hope everybody heard that. And again, if you have any questions, please chat in. But what I don't hear groveling, I, actually I heard a takeaway. I heard, I'm not even sure what I have can help you, but when we go there, we'll get a better understanding of it. So uh, you're coming from a position of authority versus uh, a different position, which actually does separate yourself from the competition that's out there right now. And, and you've been doing that, that type of approach for some time. Correct. Yeah, it, it works. I mean, it's a, doing the takeaway, it works. You know, I tell them, hey, I don't even know if we want to be in a business relationship together that we need to figure out whether you're a client that we would take on. And a lot of times you can just see their whole body language. They go from back yeah. here. To, what do you mean? Why would you not want me as your yeah. client? You know, that yeah, kind pick, of thing. Please pick me, pick me. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, you it's know that me right now, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think that is so powerful. You know, that, that uh, we get away from having to just, dance every time someone have, uh, does this. And, and again, I think not only from your military background, but just from the fact that if you're going to be that person of authority, then uh, people will respect you. They respect your time, the time that you put into it, they're listening better. But as soon as you come in being their best friend and whether it be physicals that expires, let me tell you something, when you look at the industry and you know that a majority of people are not doing it, doing very well, um, this is a great, right now, I think it's a great opportunity to separate yourself from the pack and, and, and show differences in what you do and what you service. So I think you guys are doing a great job. But also tell us about what you do from a community standpoint, because you told me some interesting things that you're doing with the military and some of that, t go into that whole thing, because that, that also shows your involvement with the community. Uh, as far as the uh, podcast that we're starting yeah, to yeah. So, yeah, so we're, how many times have you heard someone say, you know, I don't know what my dad or my grandfather or whatever did when they were in, whether it be the military or first responders, you know, we're, we're including those, um, you know, I don't know where they were, where they served, were they in combat or not, or if they, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. That wisdom, you know, it dies with the person and it's gone forever. So we started a podcast, it's called Warrior Wisdom. Um, we're building up our we're going to make sure we have a solid six to release once we go here, but we'll be going live. COVID put a little hold on it because we were being, we were trying to be nice to the uh, health of the, some of the older guys that uh, have been in combat. We wanted to interview those guys and kind of lead out with that because world war two, you know, that generation is amazing. So anyway, um, that slowed us down a little bit as far as our release, but the idea behind it is let's preserve the wisdom that these guys learned in combat and let and help us, you know, Hey, how can we apply that to our lives? Right. I've got a lot of, you know, civilian friends that they don't understand what it's like to be there, but they don't necessarily have to, they can pull some of this wisdom out by watching the podcast and apply it to their everyday life because a lot of it translates straight from, you know, 
you know, it doesn't have to be the battlefield, but for sure the battlefield and, and military uh, structure right into business. And it mm. translates nicely. So there's going to be mo- many uses for the information that we're pulling from these guys. And uh, it also is a legacy that they can leave, right? So now it's on YouTube video and it's on podcast. So all of their family can hear it and all that, you know, as long as they want. So, so it you're, kind of, you're preserving it for the family too, to, to see yeah. what grandpa did or great granddad did. Correct. Uh, in yeah, there. What, are, what are you learning from it? What do, what do you pick up from doing that and meeting these guys? It's humbling. It's humbling talking to these guys, you know, just some of the stuff they've lived through and some of the stuff they've done. And it just, it's, it's awesome. It's, there's, you can do more than you think you can do. I guess that's a, that's a really easy way to say it, but um, you can do anything. And these guys are examples of it. So it's. And these guys, uh, from the military standpoint, uh, Corey, they, they, they didn't have all the tools that you guys had, right? They, they were in a different position fighting. And yeah, uh, some of them were, depending on what, you know, what, how far back we're going or whatever. Yeah, they, they did not have, like, we've had air superiority since Vietnam. You know, that, that, a lot of people don't realize that, but there hasn't really been a real dogfight, you know, in many, many years. Um, so we've owned the skies for a long, long time, which is really a whole different ball game, you know, versus World War II, World War I, Korea, you know, that, that was, that was craziness. They were, they were taking it from all sides. So. That's interesting. I mean, I think first of all, yeah. And someone said, thank you for your service. Melissa said, thank you for the service. Uh, and uh, you know, it's so cool because you're also doing something for the community. I mean, that, that again, separates yourself from, uh, everybody else is out there. So you're doing your business, you're prospecting, calling expires and for sale bonus, you're running a real estate business. You have your military background, but you're giving back by doing that. I think that's fantastic for the memory of the families and just, just learning. I mean, I lear- I am a, a huge fan of the military. I grew up, believe it or not, I, my uncle was in, in the Marine Corps and uh, he used to take me to Quantico. Mm. So I would go to Quantico and sit in. Now you can't do Now you know you can't do this now. I was playing on helicopters and jumping into things. I was playing around with these uh, 14 karat gold leaf pieces of paper, like their crepe paper that, you know, the, mil- the pilots used to put their name on the side, you know, uh, with uh, the gold. I mean, <laughs> stuff that we were doing, there's no way that you're allowed to do that. I go to the parallel and hang out, but I have, tremendous respect for the military and now that i'm in virginia beach with navy seal so yeah thank you for your for your service here's a question from um christopher again uh doing your zoom interview are you screen sharing the cma no i'm not they've 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 got a i don't give the cma to anyone ever um i keep that that is uh that is our work right that that's when it comes right down to it, reading the market is, is what we offer to people. So they've got to have, they've got to sign before I will release anything written to them. I will talk around the numbers, but I will not give them that. So you don't, when you're doing the screen and you're doing your, are you doing a PowerPoint that goes up on the screen? No, I talk just like we're talking. talking. About. Okay, good. So then um, if it gets to the point that you're trying to close them with the listing present with the numbers, you're, so you're not showing anything. You're just talking them through what the CMA looks like. And then um, when you close them, what happens to sign? We email it to them immediately and they, uh, and they sign digitally. Okay. So they say, yeah, I'm really uh, impressed with what you have to say, Corey. And then um, you, uh, you let them know that you're going to email all this information. Now they sign obviously electronically. Correct. Yep. They sign right, you know, right then and there. We, we email it to them, they sign. And then we, you know, we set up the, we set photography up, we set appointments so that, you know, they're just more things to kind of lock them in. Right. So now I've gone through and I've explained how showings are going to work, how, you know, when photography is going to happen, what get your calendar out, what are we looking at? Um, I need a spare key when I'm going to come over on this date and put the lockbox on with, put the key in it, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we make dates and everything is scheduled um, during that appointment so that they feel, I mean, everything is kind of locked in for them at that point to, to not follow through would be strange, right? It would be just a human feeling of that would be weird of I've got several appointments already with these people. I've got this, I've already said yes, you know, and, and, and yeah, we haven't had a problem with that. 
And then what, what about, do they ever ask about the, you know, how are you going to protect me and with the COVID-19 thing? Any, how sure. do you bring up there? Yeah, so we have had that. Uh, and we tell them right off the bat, hey, we're not going to protect you. I don't want to make any, you know, uh, false claims that, you know, I'm going to say, hey, you're not going to get this. That's impossible. And I don't want to get sued because I said yeah. something. Uh, but I do say, yeah, sure, there are precautions that we can take. We'll talk to the agents before they go in. We'll make sure, you know, it, some people want them to wear gloves and masks. Some of them don't. Uh, because gloves, wearing those all the time is actually kind of a bad thing. Uh, it's, it, anyways, there's... There's thoughts through that, but right. whatever they would like, we will do as far as masks, as far as that's concerned. And then we always tell them, hey, you know, it's good of you to go grab some Germex and put it by the door and just put a little sticky on it that says, hey, please, you know, take a pump before you walk through and after you, before you walk out. And um, that's really where that has, you know, take your shoes off, you know, that kind of thing. But that's, that's what we do. We kind of walk through it with them and you, you didn't buy you didn't buy any special stuff for this. You're just telling them here's what they got to do. No, the only thing we bought is some gloves and some masks if we had to, but that's it. But we tell them because you know, once again, dollar per hour, right? If I'm out buying gloves and I'm out buying masks and I'm also running to these houses, right? Somebody's got to drive there and give it to them. Um, and what happens when they run out if we have a hot house that's showing a lot and all that kind of thing? So we tell them, hey, these are things that we would recommend that you would do and uh, that other people are doing throughout the nation. And then everybody so far that has wanted it has gladly went and put those things up and said thank you. Uh, I don't know if anybody missed this uh, in what he just said, but I, you, it's just natural for you. But I, I didn't hear this. So um, when you're doing your, your presentation, are you showing them all this fancy marketing stuff and all the other things that go on? No, no. Why not? It's a loaded question, but I want you to tell me. <laughs> because there is no need for that. They buy you, right? They're buying, they're buying you. They're, they're seeing that you're in charge and you're going to take care of things. And they don't, they just don't ask. Isn't it, guys, I just want you to understand that you know in real estate we've been oversold a whole bunch of things that we think we need and yeah. what i guess what you're saying corey is that you come in you you let them know you have a plan you let them know that you're confident in what you can do for them you're not groveling you're basically the the authority here and um they kind of feel that they like what they see and then that's it there's no how many websites do you have okay this is how many things you don't do any of that no no, very rarely am I asked that. Uh, and if I am asked that, I review what I did wrong during that interview. I love it. I mean, that, that, that is where we are going. And I think people are missing that, that today people want someone to take charge. And, and if you don't take charge, what happens? Think about you not taking charge. What happens when you don't take charge of something, whether it be the office or the military, what happens? Then you get asked all the questions that you don't want to be asked and you get into go down a bunch of rabbit holes that you don't want to go down. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's, it's the same with commission. I don't get asked about commission over half the time. Right. And that's, and that's so important right now because we've got to stand firm on what, whatever that commission is, amount is for you. And that's the separation because they're willing to still pay for someone that has the answers. I think what is pretty much what you're saying. If someone feels that you're the product and um, people are still shopping, you know, online for products and they're from high price prices to whatever, but they want someone who's going to solve this. And I think, and I don't, I'm not sure has the I buyer situation affected some of the market that you're in right now. Have, have, have they come in? Sure. Yeah, they're here. We've got, we've got that stuff going on. You know, we've got a, a company, a bunch of different ones actually. And so, yeah, there are, there's options out there. Uh, and it's kind of funny because we call those as expireds and I do exactly what I'm telling you. And all, you know, they're all actually very happy and thankful because they've gone through the other side of it where they don't have someone that's going to be helping them or, you know, taking charge and making sure that their, their goal is, what's achieved versus yeah you're giving the personal contact yeah yeah and um so what advice can you give people for this market right now 
for them. And there's agents out there may not have a team. They may not have other people. They're just starting out. And there's people just jumping into real estate business. So what kind of advice can you give them from what you've learned in the last nine years? Because you guys are doing good numbers. You guys are working very hard. What, could, what suggestions could you give them? Consistency. Be consistent. You know, make a plan and work your plan. Sounds basic because it is. The basics are what make this thing happen. Build the foundation with the basics and you will succeed in this business. How much practice time do you think someone should have in this kind of market? In this, in any market, you should have an hour a day on the schedule, in my opinion. Uh, and that's after you've already, you know, if you're a new agent, you should be either practicing or making phone calls or going to an appointment. That's it. There's nothing else you need to do. Stay away from all the shiny squirrels that are running around all over the place trying to get their hands in your pocket and all this other stuff, right? Stay away from that. So yeah, obviously your practice is going to be way more when you're at that stage. Right, right, right. So um, any books that you've read that you felt, hey, this has really been uh, helpful for me? Anything that you can get someone to uh, take a look at? I don't know if you can see it. I guess you probably can. Yeah, I see some books back there. There's a stack on there. I don't know if you can see those or not, but there's a bunch of different books out there. Um, I, I read, I've read The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. I'm KW, um, and that's not the only reason why I read it. But The Millionaire Real Estate Agent Investor, which is the blue one, has actually been as, as or more helpful to me simply because I go into my appointments as a consultant versus just a, you know, I'm not walking in just as a realtor trying to throw up commission breath all over them you know yeah. that kind of thing. so those two books have been really helpful for me and then it, of course there's a bunch of other you know extreme ownership jocko he's amazing yeah um great great information there as far as taking ownership of what you are doing and the, the next book that he wrote too the dichotomy of leadership is really good too so anyways those are just a few you know. yeah there's so many of them, but that, I really, really appreciate that. So, uh, Corey, how can someone get a hold of you if they have any questions about what you're doing and they want to learn more? What, where's, where can they get a hold of you? Sure, they can, they can email me if they want to, um, or they can find me. I'm older, so I'm on Facebook. I'm learning Twitter, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, on our email is Corey, C-O-R-Y, and A-N-D, Rhonda, R-H. O N D A at KW.com. Awesome. So listen, first of all, Corey, thanks so much for sharing today and, and, and your service. And I think it's really neat what you're doing with the, uh, the, the vets and interviewing them. And it, it, are you going to have like a, uh, what, what's your YouTube channel going to be called for that? Well, it'll be warrior wisdom. Uh, we'll get that. Uh, we're going to release all of that so I can get that information to you. We've, we've kind of held all that in right now because like I said, this COVID kind of delayed us a little bit, try to out of respect for the, and most of them funny enough would tell me, I don't care. I'm not afraid of this thing, but we are trying to be respectful. And not yeah. Yeah. That's, those are the, the, the grit, the true grit, right? Those are those guys that are just ready to do it. This yeah. is great. Listen, man, thank you so much. Thank us again for your service. And we really appreciate the information. It was great. Hope everybody enjoyed it. And, and we'd love to have you back someday. So we can talk a little bit more about what you did with the, uh, the warriors and, and the, the different interviews you've had. Awesome. Thank All you. Right, so have a great thank day. Thank you so much. Everybody. Keep it going. Thank you. Bye-bye.